Hello and welcome back to Read Becca. We're here yet again for another catch up on what I'm reading, what I'm thinking about reading. Mostly there's thinking about reading, not as much reading lately. Uh, I have been really escaping into books. I did finish quite a few things this week um, for, for obvious reasons. The everything is sort of on fire right now in the world. Um, yes, so, so I for sure got into some of the books I, I already had in progress that I was far along and just needed to get finished. So I, I finished them. And let's start with the, the first one is the one I mentioned last week that I did not bring up too much because it's, it's an odd one. Um, it's definitely not my usual sort of thing. And that is that time I got drunk and saved a demon by Kimberly Lemming. And this is uh, the first in the Mead Mishaps novels. Uh, you can see our, our main character here, Cinnamon, uh, is part of a family of, of spice farmers. <laughs> so there's a lot of foodie goofy elements. And this one's just so silly and fun kind of, but without being like poorly written or overly jokey, I would say. Um, it is a fantasy romance and we're following Cinnamon as she's in this very sort of traditional fantasy setup. Uh, where their their village is protected by this goddess who chooses heroes every several years to send out into the world and uh, protect them from these demons and monsters that, that have beset them. <laughs> and so there's that very traditional setup. However, she's coming home from the festival celebrating after their heroes have been just sent off uh, and is drunk and she trips over a demon basically <laughs> and she doesn't really realize he's a demon. Uh, she runs straight home to her family who are delightful, like they're this great cozy family who all care for each other. And um, then she kind of realizes that she has to help this demon for certain reasons. Um, she realizes that everything she thinks about how the world works is not quite right. And so naturally, she and the demon wind up on an epic quest to destroy the phylacteries of an evil ancient lich. <laughs> so it's got a great fantasy plot to it. Somehow it manages to pull that off in 175 pages. This is just a novella. Uh, so the, the actual like fantasy story plot, um, them kind of coming into having a crew. Um, there's this great like women friendship element where she has some, some, some lady friends where they're not like bickering and fighting with each other. It's great. Um, it's, it's so fun. And not only that, so this is, this is a romance. It's definitely explicit. So if you were not up for explicit content, they're not long explicit scenes or a page or two, but there are four or five definitely explicit scenes in here. Um, the romance though, I was so excited to see something I didn't even realize that I needed in romance. And that's just the two of them being goofy together. I don't think I've seen that before in romance. And like that's how my relationships really are. Like we goof off all the time. So it was so ridiculous and fun the way they interacted with each other and not in like a, a dumb way or anything, like not over the top. It was totally believable. And I think that's what makes romance is the characters. And so these were characters that you could really A, connect with as individuals and B, understand why they were connecting with each other. And it was so, so fun. Uh, so I just, I just really enjoyed the setting. I enjoyed the characters. I enjoyed this, this romance between the two. I, I was really behind them being a couple and staying together, even though Cinnamon was a little reluctant for obvious reasons to get into a relationship with a demon. So I really enjoyed this one. It was kind of exactly what I needed at the time. And I think I got this, I did actually buy this one. I don't often buy uh, ebooks because I have so many, but uh, I think Izzy from Happy For Now, who is very much a monster romance connoisseur, and that's not my sort of thing. But this one, she really sold me on um, it being worthwhile. So I, I bought it. I think as well, um, what pushed me over to reading it finally was, uh, I can't remember if it was Maya or Christina, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, one of them from Bookworm Dreams had read this as well. And it sounded, it sounded very good. So I finally did get around to reading it after having picked it up a while back. And it was absolutely, totally worthwhile. Such a fun read. So even though monster romance is not my sort of thing, I had a great, great time. So then uh, I read, sorry, cinnamon scratching. I read uh, a complete opposite. I read The Middle Grade, Aru Sha and the Tree of Wishes by Roshani Chachi. Uh, this is the third in the Aru Sha series. Now, 
Um, this is from the Rick Riordan Presents line, and obviously these are all kind of following that same framework of Rick Riordan's um, Percy Jackson novels, where it's these kind of gods and monsters, all based on some traditional heritage. So this one is is Indian mythos, um, and I didn't love this one. So I, I enjoyed it. It was entertaining. It was probably, you know, middle of the road, a three star. I think I actually like this better than the second one. The second one was really over the top with like Disney references because these are published by Disney. Uh, so it was okay. It jumps right in to the action with Aru and the um, kind of the reincarnations of the Pandavas. And they are trying to save these children from a carnival. Um, we don't know really why they're there other than they're trying to, to find someone who is a clairvoyant. Um, so of course, there's this kind of clairvoyant, we find out they're, they're twins very quickly at the beginning, and there's bad guys coming for them, and there is a prophecy that they have to stop the bad guys from finding out. And of course they don't. So that turns into this whole plot of the Pandavas and these twins racing against the baddies to figure out the, the riddle, more or less, of this prophecy. And it involves the Tree of Wishes, this mythical element. It involves, um, if you have read the first book at all, Aru is in this complicated situation with her relationship or lack of relationship with her father. Um, and she is going through this, learning more about the, the past of her father. So I think that was done pretty well. Like that, that one element of her uncovering and the, the complex emotions she has about her father throughout this. Um, what I don't think it did well is that A, it just completely throws us in at the beginning. And it did that in the first, not the first book, in the second book as well. That was a criticism I had there where it was like, I literally don't know what's going on. And then on top of that, the pace was just so fast the whole time. Um, I had a trouble following because we were just jumping from action scene to action scene. And again, that was another criticism I had of the second book. And I think it was done a little bit better here. I think this is, you know, going to be fine for a kid. They're probably going to enjoy that being completely action packed. But looking for those slower moments where Aru is being more introspective, I, I didn't get as much of that as I would have liked. So it was okay. It was it was enjoyable. I'm glad I continued on with the series. Um, there's five books. I think they're all out now. So I do plan to continue on with that one. Then this one, I don't know how I'm going to talk about. Uh, Vida Nostra by Sergei and Marina Dechenko and translated by Julia Meyer, my top Hersey. So <laughs> this is a dark academia novel. Uh, we are following Sasha and Sasha is a normal teenage girl. She is in high school age for the US. Uh, she is off to the seaside with her mother at the beginning when a strange man starts following her. And that turns into this strange man setting her to do these mundane tasks. Otherwise, there are threats against her family. So I have no idea how to describe what these strange tasks are. They're very mundane. Like, and I, I mean, like the first one is just for going, going swimming every morning. So they're very mundane things. It's, it's, this is not like really super insidious. Um, and every time she, she does these tasks, she throws up golden coins. And that doesn't really play a huge part in, in things. So I don't know why it's such a big deal is made out of that. Um, I feel like it probably has some symbolism I didn't pick up on. But I had expected that this was going to have that aspect lead very quickly into her going off to this university. So she has to com kind of complete these tasks and not question. And that's going to allow her to, to get into this school. She doesn't know it initially. That's not the case. Uh, there's a whole chunk of a year of her just repetitively comp completing mundane tasks before she even knows really where it's going. And so it's, it's very slow paced, even into once she's gone to university. It's a year. Her first year of university is the same. It's her attending these courses that she doesn't really understand. Um, the main thing that she's doing is reading and memorizing texts that she that is incomprehensible to them. Uh, she sets aside 
other courses, um, kind of basic things they're allowed to skip, uh, she stops attending them in order to focus entirely on this thing because there's so much pressure to do it. And so, so there's very little that we can really like hold on to as making sense in this novel. And again, it's extremely mundane and it's kind of like repetitive over and over. And so the first half is very much that. And then things start to get very incomprehensible. Um, the, the actual weirdness comes to fruition, I would say. And so you get to the end of this book and you still can't fully understand things. I think um, there are a number of ways of interpreting this. There is the most obvious, and I, I think that's the only one I'm going to talk about because anything else, any other interpretation would be um, spoilery-ish. So like the most obvious interpretation of this is that this is about the process of changing your nature and the ways that happens as we're kind of coming of age and entering adulthood, um, you know, a traditional university experience, and the ways that that's physically and mentally challenging to us, that we don't understand it even as it's happening to us. Um, there is this whole schism between who she is and her world of the university and her home life. Uh, we do see a lot of her relationship with her mom becoming strained and separated and that she can't share everything about her life at university with her mom or her relationships there. And we see them become increasingly disconnected and her mom move on and kind of start to have this separate life from her. So I think that's kind of the most literal take. There's a lot of weirdness to this though. And um, as I said, the, the kind of changing your nature is really big to the second half of this. So I, I enjoyed this so much. This I think I'm underselling it because I keep talking about how mundane it was and like incomprehensible it was, but I, I loved this. I think it was really fantastic. Um, I, I read previously Catherine House and I know that has had a lot of very mixed reviews. I enjoyed that one so much. And that strikes me as really similar to the first half of this, where it's just like nothing is going on. I think I, I actually described Catherine House as something like the magicians, but if all the, you know, jaded new adults basically never got any powers and never went on any adventures, they were just stuck at this isolated school and didn't really understand what was going on entirely. So that's very much what the first part of this feels like. So if you, if you like the first half, you might check out Catherine House. But I just, I really love that, that setup and, and the struggle of being a student and coming into adulthood and um, feeling very alone about that and kind of jaded in it. And so I, I really loved those, those kind of, I don't know, misanthropic elements to it of her attitude and the way she doesn't fully connect herself with anybody from the, the teachers to, um, you know, even people she's in relationships, she doesn't entirely engage. So she completely focuses in on her study and um, molding herself to this this work <laughs> that she's focused on. So yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. And that's what I finished this week. Um, I did also read a short story that was an older one, actually. It was one that I, I just randomly saw someone read and I had remembered it from years ago. Uh, it was in the awards circuit, I think in the early 20 teens, maybe. And it's um, If You Were a Dinosaur, My Love by Rachel Swirsky. And I just really recommend people read it. It seems so timely right now. It's very short. It's only like a page and a half, maybe. Um, and it's, of course, got dinosaurs. It really focuses on f feeling power when you're powerless and Im or imagining power when you're powerless. Like, what if you were a dinosaur? And it's it's incredibly emotionally powerful as a story. Like it's got a real gut punch to it. And it's, a, it's, you know, it's about dinosaurs. So it's this whole description of if you were a dinosaur, you would have all of this. And yeah, it's, it's very about bigotry as well. So I would say definitely read it. I will, I will link it down below. It's a, it's just a short story that's available online so you can read it for free. So definitely check that one out as well. Um, then all the stuff, all the stuff I have that I'm thinking about reading, really. So uh, Palimpsest, still ongoing. This this is my number one to focus on this weekend. I do have a long weekend, so we're gonna get a lot of reading done 
So this one on the go started Each of Us a Desert by Mark Oshiro. And I need to start this weekend King Rat. So Palimpsest is, is definitely the focus for this weekend, but I think I can get a good chunk done of these two this weekend as well. So that's really the goal for the weekend is to focus on those three. However, I also have, sorry, I'm looking over here to grab my giant pile here. Uh, all right. So I also have a bit of a conundrum because I have the Pillars of the Earth in progress and I did get the audio back, but I also had my hold for the audio of Black Sun by Rebecca Rowanhorse come in. And I want to uh, reread that on audio before I go into Fevered Star. So I think I'm going to delay the audio for a week on this and try to get through Black Sun this week and focus on that one because I think that's going to be a very, very quick going. I have been back at the gym, I think I mentioned last week. So I've actually been going through quite a lot of audio and enjoying that while I'm, you know, able to spend a bunch of time on the elliptical or whatever and, and the audioing. So so I think I'm going to continue reading this in print and then pick up the audio next week. And Black Sun obviously is, is a big priority on audio. Um, I did walk to the library this morning, which is very nice. It's gorgeous outside. It's like upper 70s and a nice breeze. So the humidity isn't killing us yet. And so I listened to Black Sun while I was doing that. So I got in a good like hour, hour and a half of it there. Um, I picked up some short, short books that I'm going to try, I think, and do a try a chapter and pick one of them to keep for June for a library book. So I'm trying to read from my own shelves. I just really needed to go browse the library is really what it was. I, I did a full shelf walkthrough of the fiction section while, while picking these up. I couldn't help myself from picking up a bunch of books. But I think all of them except for one are books I've wanted to read for a really long time. And the, the one that wasn't is one I've never heard of. It just had a really cool cover. So, so we'll see. We'll see what I think of, of the five books. Um, and I think that's it for bookish stuff for the week. I don't have too many life updates. I, I don't think there's much to talk about. <laughs> I don't want to talk about any of the stuff that's going on really in the world. Um, the one major thing in, in my life this week was uh, Coco, my foster cat, had a vet appointment. And um, he has been a hospice situation for me for a year and a half. So like, I've known he's dying for a very long time and he's been going downhill. And we previously had thought he was going much more rapidly and then kind of stabilized him like a year ago. And he has been doing very well for the past year. Um, and he just recently started having some real downhill on, on energy and interest in food. And so I had to take him to the vet. And of course we found out he is back to very near to organ failure, which is where we had kind of stabilized him before. And there's just nothing additional to do at this point. So unfortunately, it's not going to turn around. And that's very hard. So we just got him on a painkiller. And he's a little bit out of it. I think we're kind of sorting out our timing to, to mitigate most of that. But once we get the timing down on when he gets his doses, I think we'll be good. But he is feeling better, at least, and very interested in food comparatively to what he normally is. So that is, I think, the main positive. So he's he's doing okay, and we can just kind of keep him comfortable for as long as he's around. And unfortunately, that's going to be the situation that I've I've known we were going into, but it doesn't make it really any easier. So that's that's been very hard for, for this week. Um, Otherwise, like I'm so happy the weather has been uh, what it has. It's not been extremely hot. I really dislike the heat and humidity that we get here. So I have been enjoying the fact that we got extremely rainy weather the past few days, um, rainy storm, stormy weather with breaks of cool and uh, nice in between. And then as I said, today is really gorgeous. So I'm, I'm very in, enjoying the weather. I spent as much time outside this morning as I could. I'm about to run to the store and get some some snacks and then spend my afternoon just reading. Um, I did kind of get into binging shows at night. I've been staying up like way too late, just not able to sleep. I, I had to start taking sleeping pills again because my brain is racing. Um, I used to have terrible insomnia, so I used to take sleeping pills like every day. Um, but yeah, I, so I've, I've been having to take sleeping pills to sleep because I, I just 
cannot chill out. I'm feeling so much anxiety. Um, so I started watching Project Runway Junior and somehow I thought I had seen it. Um, and I, I recognized some of the characters, not the characters, the, the people uh, from season two. I'm, I'm into season two now. I'm almost done with it. I'm, I'm halfway through the finale. Um, but I must have seen like a single episode at the gym, maybe. I, I'm quite sure I saw some Project One Runway there, like years ago, not not recently when I started going back to the gym. Because I, I recognized a couple people, but I did not know any of the people that were in the finale. <laughs> so that has been very fun to, to see some new seasons that I hadn't actually watched before. Um, I also watched this Canadian show that's kind of the same deal, Stitched, and that's on Hulu. That one I really like because the whole format is just like it doesn't lead up to a finale really. It's each episode is for people who get knocked off one at a time to the end of the episode. So there's no like progression of a whole group of people. It's just each episode is is for new people. So I have enjoyed that one a lot. Um, it was a new one that I hadn't heard of. And then I know there's a bunch of cooking shows coming back, um, like the, the cooking competition show. I think MasterChef is coming back, um, Alton Brown's cooking show is, is going to be coming to, I think, Netflix soon. So that's very exciting. I'm really, really looking forward to, uh, it's Iron Chef. Iron Chef is the one I'm talking about. Uh, so those, I, I love those kind of shows. And of course, I, I am a little concerned for my reading this weekend because Stranger Things came out this weekend. So I'm, I'm trying to resist going completely in, down the rabbit hole of that and just binge watching the whole thing, but I probably, I probably will give in tomorrow and watch most of it. So we'll see if I go down the Stranger Things rabbit hole. So that is it, I think, for most of my week. The couple of random, like, asides that I have. I don't have any recommendations this week, and I'm just not feeling enthusiastic about anything. Um, I, I've been loving everybody's What's Cheering Me Up videos. Those are absolutely great. I keep thinking I want to make one myself and I'm just struggling to think of things because of where my brain is at right now. So yeah, but your cheering me up videos are cheering me up. So uh, I don't know what happened, but suddenly I can get mentions um, like the at, at tags on YouTube. I do not have 500 subscribers for sure. Uh, so that did not happen. And that is like supposed to be the threshold. So I keep expecting it to disappear. I must have crossed some sort of like hours watched or a number of videos type threshold that isn't advertised anywhere. I did double check and confirm it's still 500 subscribers. But, but for whatever reason, I can do that now. So that was very exciting to find out this past week. Um, the other random aside that I want to talk about is, is kind of a mild rant. Um, so this week was the Nebula Awards from the Science Fiction Writers of America at CIFWA. And they, they did it all online. It was very nice. Um, but there was a little bit of a, like a controversy as always after the fact, um, where if essentially the, the person getting the guest of honor type, not guest of honor, like the, the lifetime achievement award type situation, um, was praising someone and used an outdated term um, and so I don't want to focus on, on that, the actual controversy. What I want to talk about is what I saw with the reaction to it, really. Um, so, I mean, number one, like, this, this terminology is definitely dated. Um, I think a lot of people were downplaying that and, like, that it's still acceptable in some places. Well, yes, maybe but it's, it's very outdated. It's kind of the same thing regarding race that you would say for someone with an intellectual disability, there are, there are terms that we absolutely wouldn't allow in terms of how long it's been out of favor, how kind of inappropriate it is, but maybe still technically correct. And that's the argument people are making. Um, so I don't really want to talk about that part. So the thing I saw in the responses very overwhelmingly, I saw a lot of people responding with, well, this person is of a different time. You know, they, they grew up with this. And I just have such a problem with that. Um, I, I mean, I get it. I get it. Like I'm all for, you know, having empathy for people and um, giving people grace. Like 
I think probably the way this should have been dealt with is was much more privately addressing this person and having a discussion of did you mean to say this was a slip up you know versus what happened but beyond that people who are seniors are still existing in the world today like regardless if they you know are using antiquated words because they grew up in a certain time, they're of a different time, they're existing today. They're interacting with people of different races um, and they're negatively impacting the world around us today. So when everybody says, oh, well, they're of a different time. No, they're, they're here today. <laughs> like they're actively affecting policy. Um, so I just have a major problem with coddling seniors. It's it's so hard to hear when someone of the age that this person is, is the majority of our government representation. So do we say that that's acceptable for the people that represent us today to have antiquated ideas? I don't think so. Um, I think they need to have an understanding of, of what our life experience is today. They're of a different time, so they have different feelings, but they have to be able to exist in today's world. So yeah, I just I just have so many problems with those well-intentioned, um, outdated mores, and it frustrates the heck out of me to hear people excusing that. So I don't think we need to be mean to people that think that way, but I do think we need to confront it, and so I think that was an appropriate thing to do here. I'm not sure it was handled necessarily the best way. As I said, I think it probably should have been called out probably more privately than it was. But so I think that's my rant. Uh, please don't cuddle seniors because they live in the world with us today and they're kind of destroying our country. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, so I think that's all I have for this week. I hope that you are being kind to yourself and doing whatever you need to, to keep yourself well and happy. Um, yeah, that's all I've got. Thank you so very much for watching. Okay, so I know it's dark in here, but this has to be the worst <laughs> recommendation that I've ever gotten from Goodreads. I do not think Manhunt and Legends and Lantes has anything to do with each other. I'm pretty sure that these two birds are just taunting Rue. <laughs> doing his best to ignore them. <laughs> what a good boy, Rue. What a sunset. Oh, the birds are having a great time on my plants. I think right now we're having more fun playing through the wheel. <laughs> the two of them keep hunting each other through the wheel. <laughs> oh, we better watch out. You're gonna get pounced. <laughs> That's a good stretch. Why are you like rubbing yourself on the rocks? Hmm? <laughs> what a goober. Did your tongue get stuck out? Ripley loves to play a dangerous game of stop cinnamon from going outside. <laughs> but Ripple, hey, what are you doing? What? What's going on, lady? What? You're such a goof. Cinnamon, there are so many water bowls. You do not have to go use the water bowl that Coco likes. There are lots of places to get a drink. So we go through this very often.
where Cinnamon is like, I, I'm waiting in line, I'm gonna get a drink. <laughs> but Coco lives by this water bowl and does not like it when Cinnamon gets his drink from it. <laughs> oh, Coco, is he trying to use your water? Oh. Cinnamon, we have so many other waters. <laughs> Such a goof. Poor Coco. As you can see, Coco still loves his brushy arch. <laughs> he would stand here and do this all day if he didn't have such a grueling schedule of naps. Huh, Coco? Is that the good stuff? What a goof. Yeah, you're a goof. You know I'm talking about you. Huh, Coco? What a good boy.